Hello and welcome to the Adva Hazy Centre here near Dulles Airport which is a part of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Now this is one of my favourite aviation and space museums in the world and in this video I'm going to take you on a guided tour of it. It's going to be a pretty long video so if there's a particular aircraft type that you're interested in then I'm going to list them all down below in the video description. I'm also going to do timestamps as usual so you can click on those but otherwise sit back and enjoy the show. There are some incredible displays in here including the Space Shuttle Orbiter, the actual record breaking Bell X-1, the B-29 that dropped the first ever atomic bomb in anger and even a German Horton flying wing. Here is a map of the whole museum and I plan to start on the left looking at the military aircraft and then checking out the space display in the middle and then more aircraft on the right. It's an incredible place so let's get into it. We'll start down at ground level. Although the whole museum has raised platforms which provide a brilliant view of everything and I'll include footage from those later. Let's work our way down the ramp and first up is the Republic F-105D Thunder Chief which was a supersonic fighter bomber that could carry both nuclear and conventional weapons and first flew in 1959. Just showing you how rapidly aircraft design was progressing, even though it only had a single turbojet engine, it had a greater bomb load than either the B-17 Flying Fortress or the B-24 from World War II. In Vietnam, two-seat versions of these were used as wild weasels where they would draw attention from this next missile, the Soviet SA-2, and destroy the launch site with either an anti-radiation missile or other munitions. This is the type of missile that shot down Gary Powers in his U-2 in 1960 but it was first used the year beforehand in China where a Taiwanese Martin IB-57D Canberra was shot down at 65,600 feet, although they credited it to a Chinese fighter to keep the SA-2 program secret. Next is the Bell AH-1F Cobra, which was an attack version of the Huey that you'll see next. It shared the same engine, prop and transmission, but attached to a much thinner fuselage. These had a whole array of weapons including rockets, miniguns, cannons and grenade launchers. Next is the famous Huey which was an incredibly durable transport helicopter built in greater numbers than any other US military aircraft except for the B-24 bomber. But if more room was needed there was this Boeing Vertol CH-46E Sea King which incredibly was in service from 1964 until 2015. It was the first marine turbine powered assault helicopter as the predecessor H-21 was powered by less reliable pistons. This operated as the main medium lift helicopter before eventually being replaced by the MH-60 and MV-22 Osprey. These could carry up to 24 troops, 15 stretchers and 2 attendants or 7,000 pounds of equipment. This is a Sikorsky JIS-1 amphibious seaplane that was actually at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. These first flew in 1935 and were used to transport cargo and humans, a search and rescue and patrol role. Immediately after the attack, this was sent to look for the Japanese fleet. In a civilian role, these were known as the Baby Clippers and could carry between 18 and 25 passengers in a reasonable amount of comfort for that era. This is the JB-2 Loon missile which was an American reverse engineered German V-1 flying bomb. These came too late for the war in Europe but were planned to be used in the invasion of Japan although that never eventuated thankfully. Behind is the F-100 Super Sabre, the first USAF jet to break the sound barrier and level flight and next to it is a fuselage of a B-17 awaiting restoration. Let's jump back to near where we started and keep exploring. Next is the Soviet MiG-21F and in front of that is a small white Atoll missile which was a Soviet copy of the American Sidewinder at air heat seeking missile. In 1958 an F-86 fired one at a Chinese jet and it lodged itself but didn't detonate so they flew back to the base and gave it to the Soviet allies. The MiG-21 was the Soviet's second generation fighter and capable of reaching Mach 2. It remained quite a thin and agile design which allowed for it to be fast even though it only had a single turbojet engine. Over 11,000 of these were built all around the world. It had the central nose cone which both provided room for a radar system as well as creating a shockwave to slow incoming supersonic air so that it could be ingested by the engine. Next is a McDonald F-4S Phantom II. In this aircraft in 1972 the crew engaged three enemy MiGs and successfully shot down a MiG-21 like the one you just saw. 
These heavy but very powerful twin-engine jets operated as fighter bombers, interceptors and also in a wild weasel role to destroy enemy missile sites. These upward deflections on the wingtips were because they discovered later during wind tunnel testing that it was quite unstable, and instead of adjusting the angle of the whole wing, which would have been quite a big deal that late in the development program, they were able to just get away with angling up the wingtips. Next is an AN-APG-59 radar, and this is the reason why the F-4 has such a large nose, as these would sit inside it. It was to allow for the radar systems and sometimes guns, hence why jets move their nose-mounted air intakes to the sides or underside as we see with the F-16. This next aircraft is a Grumman A-6E intruder, which was a subsonic or weather attack aircraft and flown by the US Navy, therefore it would take off and land on a carrier and the Marine Corps. Their impressive range and bomb load allowed them to complete many low-altitude intrusion missions to destroy enemy targets. The Navy replaced them with the F-14D from 1997. This is the Lockheed Martin X-35B, which was a stealthy supersonic multi-role fighter. This prototype includes a lift fan engine and was the first aircraft in history to do a short takeoff, reach supersonic speed in level flight, and perform a vertical landing all within the same flight. This then became the F-35 Lightning II. This aircraft was designed to operate for multiple different services such as the Navy and the Air Force, and also relies heavily on technology rather than raw power and maneuverability. So it has a slower top speed than the latest Russian jets, but will destroy them from 100 miles away. Next we have a Grumman EA-6B Prowler, which will look familiar because it's based on the A6 that we saw two planes ago. This is an electronic warfare aircraft and fly with the attack group where their role is to confuse enemy defences by jamming their radars and communication systems, and they also carry anti-radiation missiles too, which are drawn to those radiation-emitting enemy radars. And in blue is the McDonnell Douglas fa 18 Sea Hornet. It's an all-weather, multi-role, carrier-capable fighter and attack aircraft. This one served in Operation Desert Storm in 1991 and was then transferred to the Blue Angel Navy Demonstration Team in 2015. There is a Super Hornet version which first flew in 1995 and these look similar but have a 25% larger airframe, more powerful engines and upgraded avionics. While the Hornet has mostly been retired, these Super Hornets remain in service including with my home country Australia. Up here on the roof we have the Sikorsky HH-52A Seaguard, which was the US Coast Guard's first turbine powered chopper and the first that could land in water without using complicated floats, thus making it a great rescue aircraft. Next is the Grumman F-14D Tomcat, a twin engine, carrier launched supersonic and variable sweep fighter. These were originally designed around a radar system and a Phoenix air-to-air -air AIM-54 missiles that would operate in a fleet defence role, air superiority and precision strike role. This actual aircraft was credited with one MiG kill in 1989 near the coast of Libya. The USA retired these in 2006, although the Iranian Air Force still fly them, albeit in low numbers due to the lack of spare parts due to the trade embargoes. A variable sweep wing design, similar in theory to the F-111 and Tornado from that era, was designed to maximise both advantages of a minimal and maximum wing sweep, and while it would produce impressive numbers, as this did have a top speed of Mach 2.4, and would also allow for easier carrier landings, it was very complex and heavy, hence why newer jets have gone back to fixed wings. Moving along is the Vought RF-8G Crusader, with a rather unique looking chin air intake. This allowed it to keep a fairly narrow fuselage as there were no side mounted air intakes and allowed for room above it for the radar system. It's a single seater supersonic carrier based jet and the last American fighter to use guns as the primary weapon so it was called the last of the gunfighters. This was a photo reconnaissance version hence why there are those transparent screens on the sides of the fuselage with massive cameras behind them. It first flew in 1955 and was the first carrier-based fighter capable of exceeding 1,000 miles per hour. You can see here the variable incidence wing, which was a novel idea where the wing's angle of attack could be changed in relation to the rest of the fuselage. 
This would help slow the landing and takeoff speed, which was important for a carrier. Newer carrier-based jets were so powerful that this wasn't really necessary. Next is an extremely shiny Lockheed T-33A Shooting Star. This was the USAF's jet trainer from 1948 until 57, and based on the F-80, which was the first mass-produced American jet fighter. This fighter itself was only average because it was immediately outpaced by the swept wing MiG-15, resulting in the F-86 being rushed into the air. And speaking of both of those aircraft, here they are. First is the F-86, which was America's first swept wing jet, allowing it to battle with the MiG-15 over Korea. Just under 10,000 were built, including in Australia, where the Aussies installed more powerful Rolls-Royce turbojet engines, significantly increasing their performance. The new wing did allow for a great top speed. In fact, it could hit 687 miles per hour at sea level, although interestingly, one did probably break the sound barrier in a dive, although that record doesn't count, as speed records need to be done in level flight. They had six 50 cal Browning machine guns in the nose, although rockets and bombs could also be fitted. And here's the primary adversary, that MiG-15. This aircraft terrified the Americans when it arrived as it really was an advanced design. It first flew in 1947, and while the wing design was advanced, Soviet jet engines were not. In fact, it was the Brits that led the world at the time. The UK government was keen to improve relations with the Soviets, so they gave them Rolls-Royce Neen turbojets, including the blueprints, which were subsequently copied and assembled not under license. It was quite a policy failure on behalf of the Brits. Next is a really special piece of history. It's the Bell X-1. This very aircraft on October 14, 1947 became the first plane to fly faster than the speed of sound. It was powered by Reaction Motors XLR-11 rocket engine, producing 6,000 pounds of thrust with four separate chambers burning liquid oxygen and ethyl alcohol diluted with water. It was launched from the Bombay of a B-29, and it went on, after that Mach 1 flight, to break more records including reaching Mach 1.45, or 957 miles per hour, and an altitude of 71,900 feet. The shape was based on a Browning 50 cal bullet, which was known to be stable in supersonic flight, and it was fitted with a straight wing. They were aware of swept wings at the time, but they weren't comfortable to use them just yet. There was the Bell X-1B, and that is on display at the National US Air Force Museum, and there's a video on that on my channel. Let's move into the space section, and first up is the Space Shuttle Orbiter Discovery. This was the longest serving orbiter, completing 39 missions, travelling 150 million miles, and spent a combined total of 365 days in space. This was one of six built, although one of those, the Enterprise, was only used for atmospheric testing and never went into space. These were the result of the NASA project to create a reusable orbital spacecraft and were in operation between 1981 and 2011. Sadly, two were lost, one with a launch failure and another during re-entry. This orbiter was intentionally left in the same condition as when it returned to Earth for the final time and it's fascinating seeing the heat-resistant tiles in various stages of decay. I explain the different skin surfaces in more detail in a separate video, although they calculated which areas would heat the most and use different materials. In fact, the upper sections, which were not exposed to extreme hot temperature, were covered in a cloth-like material. It has a double delta-shaped wing, and at the rear were several engines, and below those was a heat-resistant panel to shield the lower engines from the extreme re-entry heat. It had three main engines, powered by fuel from the attached orange fuel tank, and these could be swiveled to give directional control during the launch, and once they reached orbit, they will be turned off for the rest of the mission. The other smaller engines were used for directional control within space. Looking underneath, and you can see the state of the tiles and the tricycle landing gear. This isn't deployed until just before touchdown, and once it's down, it cannot be retracted until the next mission. There were multiple redundancies to ensure that it would be lowered, and if they all failed, then there were small explosives that would fire to lower it and avoid a belly landing. Here we have a 1 in 48th scale model of the Saturn V launch vehicle, and I'll take you around a proper one of those in Houston in another video. They're pretty incredible considering how old they are, and really are massive. Next is a Mercury Capsule 15B, and what's especially interesting is that this is in the orbital configuration, unlike most other ones you see, including the next one. This still has the rockets attached to the underside and the unused parachutes attached to the other end. 
This was due to take Ellen Shepard into space, but was cancelled due to the success of the other Mercury missions, and resources were moved to the Gemini project. Next is the Mercury capsule Big Joe, which was the second ever launched and unmanned. You'll see that its heat shield has the scarring showing that it has been put through the Earth's atmosphere. Instead of the pilot, it had a lot of automated equipment and prepared the way for the first manned launch. Next is the Mercury capsule Friendship 7, and this is the very one that took John Glenn into orbit for the first time ever for an American. It was launched by an Atlas rocket, it orbited the world three times and returned to Earth five hours later. This is an incredible piece of history. Now this is interesting, it's a Gemini paraglider capsule. Instead of returning to Earth with the parachute and then landing in the ocean, NASA considered installing an inflatable paraglider from inside the module. This would allow a controlled descent and a landing on a runway, and while NASA did cancel the idea, North American built this full-scale example and dropped it from a helicopter to ensure that it worked, and it did. This is the Apollo Command Module Astronaut Trainer, and this very one was used by the Apollo 11 crew to practice their routines and emergencies. The flotation collar and bags attached to this display are the actual ones from the real Columbia Command Module used in Apollo 11 that brought Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins home. This is the MQF, the Mobile Quarantine Facility, which, as the name suggests, was used for astronauts when they returned from the moon. The idea is that this would prevent the spread of any unknown lunar contagions, and included a living and sleeping quarters, a kitchen and a bathroom. It was in a negative pressure room and all expelled air was filtered. This is the actual one used by the Apollo 11 crew where they remained for 65 hours while it was all flown from the aircraft carrier Hornet to the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Once scientists were sure that they weren't carrying any moon germs, they were allowed out. And moving further along is the Gemini heat shield. Traveling at 17,000 miles per hour, it generated a lot of heat, but interestingly, actually created a shockwave in the atmosphere, which held off a lot of that heat. A lot of this technology came from the early ballistic missile warhead designs. This is a Redstone missile, which was the first American large-scale liquid-fueled missile to become operational. Modified versions of these put the first American artificial satellite into orbit in 1958, and the first American into space. As a missile, it had a range of 250 miles and could carry a conventional or nuclear warhead. It was replaced by the all-solid fuel Pershing missile in 1964. The Corporal Missile was the first American operational guided ballistic missile and could carry either a conventional or nuclear warhead. It first flew in 1947, but it didn't become operational until 1954. This is a Little John missile and was a short-range surface-to-surface US Army missile and also fitted with either conventional or nuclear warheads. Moving over to this light-coloured German Fritz guided bomb from World War II. These were dropped from high altitude, which would otherwise make aiming almost impossible, and guided by a joystick and transmitter on board the plane. Spoilers in the tail would move, changing its trajectory. Later versions used a wire to direct them, as they would avoid radio interference. This green thing is a German experimental anti-aircraft missile from World War II, and was deployed in March 1945, much too late for the war effort. It was guided by an operator using a telescopic sight and joystick connected to the missile via radio waves. This light coloured object is a German HS-293A1, and it was an air launched and assisted by liquid fuel rockets that fired for 10 seconds and then the Bombardier would control it via a joystick and radio waves. These sank several Allied ships from mid-1943. This large and brightly coloured Ryan Tosha R1 missile was a German two-stage anti-aircraft missile tested towards the end of the war. It was one of the largest solid fuel rockets of the war, but mostly supplanted by the R3 version. Only 82 of these were ever launched. Continuing the German theme, jumping across we have the V2's turbo pump. This drew propellants from the tanks and pushed them into the combustion chamber. In fact, around 20,000 pounds of water, alcohol and liquid oxygen were moved in the 60 second burn. And this here is that combustion chamber cut away so that you can partially see inside, where the 25 tonnes of thrust was developed. The heat inside here would reach around 4,900 degrees Fahrenheit. 
The next exhibit is an American Redstone rocket engine, which would be attached to the Redstone rocket we saw a moment ago. This was one of the first American liquid fuel rocket engines mass produced. This was the engine used to put Alan Shepard into space for the first time and was the forerunner of many other large engines, including the Space Shuttle Orbiter's main rocket engines. This produced around 78,000 pounds of thrust. This is a 1 to 24 scale Navajo missile and booster designed to be an intercontinental surface to surface missile that could carry a nuclear warhead, but it was cancelled. I show you a full scale X-10 missile used during the developmental process in my US Air Force Museum from Dayton. Here's the engine it would use, a two chambered liquid fueled rocket engine that would work as a booster until it was flying fast enough for the ramjet engines to be used. It was all incredibly complex leading to its cancellation as the cost was almost $1 billion. Next is the Jupiter S3 rocket engine, which was a modification of the Redstone engine and this powered the Jupiter missile that was the first American intermediate range ballistic missile. This was modified with the addition of upper stages and redesignated the Juno 2, which became a launch vehicle for the lunar probes and satellites. This is a H1 rocket engine, which evolved from the Jupiter missile engine. Eight of these powered the first stage of the Saturn 1 and 1B rockets. Saturn 1Bs launched Apollo 7, the first human Apollo test vehicle into space in 1968. This two-chamber engine is a Titan 1 XLR-87, powering the first stage of the Titan 1 intercontinental ballistic missile, and I'll show you one of those missiles in my video filmed at the Air Force Museum in Dayton. This is a full-scale model Pac-2 missile used in the Patriot ground-launched interceptor system. This is a standard missile 3, a three-stage US Navy ship launched interceptor to defend against short and medium range ballistic missiles with a range of 300 miles and up to an altitude of over 100 miles. This is the RAM-8J Talos ship to air missile used from 1957 to 1979. It had a ramjet main stage that fired up after the first stage rocket got it up to speed and then dropped off. This is a Subrock anti-submarine missile operated by the US Navy that was launched from underwater where it rises to the surface and flies for up to 50 miles before ejecting its rocket motor and re-entering the water to home in on the enemy submarine. They entered operation in 1965 and could carry a nuclear warhead. Next up and straight ahead is the Agena B upper stage. This was used during the 1960s as an orbital injection vehicle for MIDAS and other satellites. It was fitted into a Thor or Atlas D launch vehicle. Between 1960 and 63, it was used as the Corona photo reconnaissance satellite, which flew under the name of the Discoverer. Moving back towards the spatial orbiter, and we have the AGM 76A Falcon missile. It was an air to ground version of the Falcon missile that was usually air to air. This one has tufts of string attached to show how air would flow over it during aerodynamic testing. The AGM-76 was planned to be used on the F-108 and then the Lockheed F-12, although neither made it into production. By the way, these videos take a long time to edit and research. In fact, the script for this one was around 8,000 words, so if you enjoyed it and want to see more of these long guided tour videos through museums, then please give it a thumbs up and comment below. Moving on, and this massive grey looking missile is the US Navy Poseidon C-3. These were submarine launched ballistic missiles used from 1971 until the early 1990s, and these replaced the Polaris missiles. As you can see there are two stages and these carried 14 nuclear warheads, each capable of hitting separate targets. These started to be replaced by the Trident C-4 from 1979. The smaller missile in front is an air-launched anti-satellite missile that could operate up to an altitude of 350 miles. Five were tested, including one launched from an F-15 fighter jet, which successfully destroyed an old American satellite in 1985, but the program was eventually cancelled. This is an AGM-86A, which was the first USAF air-launched cruise missile. It could carry either a conventional or nuclear warhead and was powered by a turbofan engine. Because it flew so low to the ground, it was difficult for enemy radars to detect. This big white thing is a Pegasus XL air launch vehicle, 
which is flown up to 39,000 feet on the mothership, such as a Lockheed L-1011, where it's dropped and the rocket engine kicks in, taking it up to space. It's capable of carrying a 1,000 pound payload, such as a satellite into orbit. This green thing is a TM-61C Matador, which was the second version of the USAF Matador cruise missile. It was launched by solid fuel rockets before an onboard jet engine took over the rest of the journey. They were replaced by the MACE cruise missile in 1962. This is a P-15 Termit surface-to-surface anti-ship missile put into service in 1958. In 1967, an Egyptian Termit sunk the Israeli destroyer Elat. This is a replica of a rocket that Robert Goddard used for the first successful rocket test using liquid fuel in March 16, 1926. It reached an altitude of 41 feet while covering a horizontal distance of 184 feet. Let's jump into the future again and look at some of these space vehicles. This larger structure with the brown head is a Vega solar system probe bus and landing apparatus. This flew by Venus and launched several instruments and landers and then it flew through the tail of Halley's Comet. In front of it is a full-scale engineering prototype Mars Pathfinder lander and Sojourner rover. Reaching Mars in July 1997, this entered through the thin atmosphere and was slowed by parachutes and then rockets before bouncing a landing on inflated airbags. Then it unfolds, revealing the Sojourner, which drove off it to study the Martian surface. It's hard to gauge the size of these things from NASA photos, so it's incredible to see it in the metal, and we'll see more of these in my Museum of Flight video. This is a Space Lab subsystem igloo, which was an enclosed laboratory module. Next is a space lab transfer tunnel joggle section which allowed for internal passage of equipment and astronauts between the space shuttle's mid-deck cabin crew and the space lab in the shuttle's open payload bay. It's really fascinating seeing it in the flesh because it really highlights how large everything is. This Vega atmospheric experiment and balloon was released from the spacecraft into Venus's atmosphere. Under it was a gondola of instruments 42 feet long and they measured the velocity, density, light levels and the pressure as it floated around Venus for two days. In this cabinet is the spacesuit of James Irwin, which he wore on the Apollo 15 moon landing in 1971. It's an incredibly complex suit and it's completely covered in moon dust, which is actually very abrasive, but it's great that they've kept it in the original condition. This is a toilet from space, which is made especially complicated by the lack of gravity, therefore the person has to be well strapped in to ensure there isn't any leakage into the rest of the cabin, which sounds lovely. Now if you enjoy these types of videos, please comment below and give the video a thumbs up. It encourages YouTube to promote it so that I don't have to do product placements and promote something I'm paid to say is amazing. It's obviously quite expensive flying from Australia and making these videos. But enough about me, let's get back to the aircraft. This is the Curtis SB-2C-5 Helldiver, which was a carrier-based dive bomber operated by the US Navy, where it supplemented and replaced the Douglas SBD Dauntless. It was powered by a Wright R-2600 14-cylinder air-cooled radial engine and had onboard guns, rockets and bombs stored in an internal bomb bay and under-wing hardpoints. It could also carry Mark 13 torpedoes. It wasn't overly popular with air crews due to its size, weight and reduced range when compared with the SPD replaced. Next we jump over to the German side with the last remaining Dornier DO-335 Arrow, which was a heavy fighter introduced in 1944. It was one of the fastest piston aircraft ever built and had a unique push and pull arrangement providing the power of two engines but without the usual increase in drag of a widened fuselage or positioning the two engines on the wings. You have to look fairly closely, but there is a propeller right at the tail of the plane. The war ended before this entered large-scale production, but it certainly shows how advanced and unique German designs were. Next is another gem, and it's the only one anywhere in the world. It's the Arado AR-234B Blitz. This was the world's first operational jet bomber and reconnaissance aircraft and was introduced in September 1944. With a top speed of 459 miles per hour, it easily eluded Allied piston fighters. 214 were built, but it arrived too late to have a meaningful influence over the war's outcome. 
This jet was captured in Norway by the British and handed over to the Americans. Next is a Heinkel HE219, which is the only sole survivor of its type. It was a night fighter and the first German aircraft fitted with a steerable nose wheel and ejection seats. Those antennas on the front were what it would use to identify Allied aircraft while flying at night and then use up to eight cannons to destroy them. Some of the engineering coming out of Germany during World War II was pretty impressive, and it's lucky that poor decisions from their leadership, well, other than starting the whole war of course, led them to lose probably faster than they otherwise would have. I'll show you the flying wing jet and the rocket interceptor later in the video. This is a Fokker Wolf FW190F, which made up the backbone of the Luftwaffe's fighter command, in addition to the BF-109. This was the only German fighter powered by a radial engine and the only fighter in the war with an electrically operated landing gear and flaps. These first flew in 1939. Above is a Horton wing, which probably flew as the HO3, but someone modified it by removing the seat and installing test equipment. Later on in the video, I'll show you the incredible Horton HO229 flying wing jet, and also we have a Northrop flying wing too. Moving into some civilian aircraft, and we have the Junkers Ju-52. This German-designed transporter first flew in 1930, first flying in a civilian role before the Nazis took over the company for the war effort, much to the objection of Hugo Junkers. Powered by three BMW 9-cylinder air-cooled radial piston engines, and 4,800 of these were built. They used a corrugated Dura-Luminum metal skin which was stronger but did create more drag than other similar and smoother materials. These could carry 17 passengers or 3 tons of freight and were used throughout the world, although during World War II they were the Luftwaffe's primary transporter and even served as bombers. This small aircraft is a Belanca CF which was the first American built prototype for the first line of successful cabin aircraft. This was unique because the passengers were all enclosed in a relatively quiet and comfortable cabin rather than exposed to the weather. Next is something special because it's the only one left in the world, it's the Boeing 307 Stratoliner. This was derived from the B-17 Flying Fortress Bomber and was the first airliner in revenued service with a pressurised cabin, which with the supercharged engines allowed it to cruise over rough weather. It was also significantly faster than the likes of the DC-3. Initially it had a capacity of 33 passengers, although that eventually increased to 60. Only 10 of these were ever built because there was more interest in the Douglas DC-6 and Lockheed Constellation. This aircraft was restored, but crashed in 2002 on the delivery flight to the museum, so it was restored a second time. I should mention that the Lockheed Constellation is often considered to be the airliner that introduced the world to comfortable pressurised flight, and that's sort of a technicality. This Boeing was actually first, but with only 10 built, barely anyone flew in them. It was the Connie that would have been the first actual pressurised airliner that most people saw in the metal. Next is an Air France Concorde. This supersonic airliner that first flew in 1969, which was the same year as the first 747 flight, has this Ogival Delta wing, which I'll explain more in my Concorde and TU-144 videos. It was powered by four turbojet engines, which did come with afterburners, although they weren't required for supersonic crews, thus saving fuel. It's interesting that they went with turbojets as everyone else was moving towards turbofans at the time, although it's because the turbojets were physically much smaller, therefore it would create a lot less drag at supersonic speed. Speaking of the TU-144 again, one of those versions did have turbofans and they were noticeably much larger, thus producing more drag. And speaking of the Constellation just before, which was far more popular than the 307, this ahead of you is the Lockheed C-121C based off the longer Super Constellation. This was a military version with cargo doors and a strengthened landing gear. It has a very unique and slick shape with that long nose wheel strut, lifting the whole fuselage further off the ground to ensure the huge props wouldn't hit the tarmac. The props themselves were spun by four huge Wright R3350 18-cylinder radial engines producing around 3,400 horsepower each and originally used in the B-29 Superfortress. 
They had a unique turbo compound system where the turbine recovers energy from the exhausting gases. But instead of this driving a turbocharger, that energy is directly transferred to the output shaft. Then at the back, we have the unique tri-tail where the surface area of a large single vertical fin was spread over three smaller ones, thus allow it to fit into a smaller hanger. This setup did add additional complexity though, and as we'll see shortly with the Boeing-80, the next generation of airliners reverted back to the single tail design and they just built bigger buildings. Directly above is the Virgin Atlantic Global Flyer, which was an all-composite jet that Steve Fawcett used in 2005 to fly solo and non-stop around the world in 67 hours. It contains 13 fuel tanks holding 2,915 gallons of fuel, which makes up 83% of the whole aircraft's weight. Next on the left, we have the first ever Sikorsky YH-19A. This was the first practical single rotor utility aircraft where they solved the center of gravity issues with the previous ones by moving the engine forward and below the cockpit and putting the passenger compartment below the rotor hub. This series of helicopters went on to be used by all US military branches throughout the 1950s. Next is the main landing gear of an Airbus A330 and A340 and these weigh 7,500 pounds each. This was removed from an A330 that had a forced landing in 2001 and put on display because they weren't allowed to put it on any other aircraft, of course. And looking at the Concorde's nose landing gear, what this doesn't show you is just how tall the Concorde is. The delta wing is great at high speed, but at low speed it doesn't produce a lot of lift, therefore the nose has to be lifted up a long way, which is a high angle of attack, for the landing and takeoff. But because of this high angle, the tail is at risk of a ground strike, therefore the whole plane had to be raised up. This small aircraft here is a Sikorsky X-2 high speed technology demonstrator. Now one of the problems with increasing helicopter speed is the loss of lift on one side which limits forward speed so they've got around this problem with coaxial rotors on top of each other. They encounter retreating blade stall at the same time and counteract each other. In 2010 this reached a speed of 288 miles per hour or 463 kilometers an hour. Moving past the Boeing 307, we move towards the Boeing 367-80, also known as just the Dash 80. This was a prototype demonstrating the jet design and was modified into the KC-135 tanker for the military and the Boeing 707 civilian airliner, both of whom were incredibly successful. The tanker version remains in service to this day, albeit with newer turbofan engines. It was this very aircraft that Tex Johnson famously barrel rolled in 1955 when showing it off to the airline executives watching from the ground. It's commonplace now, although the swept wing design was unique for an airliner and putting the engine in pods underneath the wings, unlike inside the wings as we saw with the de Havilland Comet, had a number of advantages. They were much easier to perform maintenance on and replace them and if there was a problem in flight, they were kept well away from the wing. In fact, with a Comet, they actually had to line the engine with armour so that the wing and fuselage would be protected if there was an uncontained explosion. While looking almost identical, the production 707 and KC-135 were wider than this aircraft. In fact, the American Airlines boss told Boeing that he wouldn't buy it unless it was an inch wider than the Douglas DC-8. What's also interesting is that the same nose has been used on the 727 and the 737 with minor modifications. So a brand new 737-8 MAX has essentially the same nose as this. This was originally fitted with turbojet engines, although later models were fitted with more efficient turbofans. And the VC-137 version flew as Air Force One and I'll take you on a tour through that in another video. The 707 first flew in 1957 and a very small number remain in service to this day, although not carrying passengers. Spinning around and we have the Lockheed P-38J Lightning, which was a single seat twin piston engine fighter used during World War II. It was extremely versatile operating as a general fighter, a night fighter, a long range escort fighter and even did some bombing itself. Over 10,000 of these were built. And looking up, we have an incredible piece of history. It's Enola Gay, the actual B-29 Superfortress that dropped the atomic bomb 
in August 1945 on Hiroshima, the first ever dropped in anger in the history of the world. It then flew the weather recon flight for the second bomb's original target, Kokura, and while it did report clear skies, when Boxcar arrived, the city was obscured by smoke, so it went to Nagasaki instead. After war, it was involved in atomic testing at Bikini Atoll, but didn't actually drop the bomb. After that, it was returned to the USA, and in 1946, it was decided to preserve her and transfer her to the Smithsonian Institution. The B-29 itself was the most expensive single program of World War II, even more so than the Manhattan Project to make the bomb, and introduced a whole range of design features. It was pressurised, hence the unique rounded shape of the fuselage, although interestingly, they would depressurise it when flying over combat zones, so that any minor scratch from shrapnel wouldn't cause a dramatic pressure differential that could tear the whole plane apart. It had a complex remote gun turret system, where a single man could control multiple turrets at the flick of a switch, and there was no need for an actual person to sit inside the turret itself. It was powered by four Wright R3350 Cyclone Turbo Supercharged engines, pushing it to a top speed of around 339 miles per hour. This smaller aircraft is a Republic P-47D Thunderbolt, which was one of, of the main American fighters of World War II. 15,000 of these were built and they operated as high altitude fighters and in a ground attack role armed with eight 50 cal machine guns and 5 inch rockets or 25,000 pound bomb load. It would weigh up to 8 tons when fully loaded, making it one of the heaviest fighters of the war. The modern ground attack A-10 Thunderbolt II took its name from this aircraft. Next is one of only three left anywhere in the world, the Kawanishi N-1K which was a lander-based fighter used by the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service. It was considered to be one of the best fighters of the war from either side. It was extremely maneuverable and would automatically extend flaps during turns. Unlike the Mitsubishi A6M0, this was able to compete well against the later Allied fighters such as the P-51, Corsair and the F-6F Hellcat. This float plane was designed to be launched from submarines, and this is the only example HEM-6A anywhere in the world. They designed a number of submarines to operate as aircraft carriers, and the idea was that these would take these planes to the US mainland, and even the Panama Canal and wreak havoc. These never saw combat. This is the Kawasaki Ki-45, which was a night fighter version of the two-seater twin-engine heavy fighter. Originally, it was a long-range escort fighter, although it struggled against more agile single-engine fighters, so it was changed to operate as a day and nighttime interceptor and strike fighter. This here is a nose section of a Kyushu J7W1, which was a Japanese prop-driven prototype fighter plane with wings at the rear of the fuselage, forward canards, and a pusher engine. It was meant to be a short-range interceptor in response to the B-29 raids and armed with four forward-firing 30mm cannons in the nose. Only two prototypes were finished by the end of the war. This twin-engine aircraft is the only Nakajima J1N1 left anywhere in the world and was used as a night fighter, reconnaissance and in kamikaze missions. This one has several search antennas fitted to the nose, although others had search lights and others just installed more guns in the nose. These did have some success against B-29s, although they would only have a chance for one pass as the Boeing was much faster. Next, we have this yellow Northrop N-1M, which first flew in 1940. Jack Northrop's first flying wing from 1929 had it twin tail booms, so this was going to be the first proper flying wing, which he believed would have less drag and greater efficiency than traditional aircraft shapes. This was built of plywood around a tubular steel frame and powered by two engines. Its handling was average, although it led to later designs including the XB-35, the YB-49 and eventually the B-2 Spirit Stealth Bomber, and I've got a guided video around a prototype of that on my channel. Next is a Northrop P-61C Black Widow, which was the first American plane designed from the start to be a night fighter. By moving the engines to the side, it freed up the nose for the installation of a large radar, thus allowing it to detect enemy aircraft in both bad weather and at night. Now I will mention the Horton HO229, 
which was difficult to film as it was in between all of the other aircraft and it's also been disassembled. This is the only example anywhere in the world and it was a German prototype fighter bomber. It was the first flying wing design powered by jet engines and first flew in 1944. It came about after Hermann Göring asked for a light bomber that could fly at 1000 km an hour, which is 620 miles, and over a range of 1000 km. To reach those speeds, the Horton brothers believed that they'd need thirsty jet engines, and to fly that far, they'd need as sleek a shape as possible. The flying wing could theoretically create a lot less drag, hence why they built this. This was the third one, although it was only partially assembled when it was captured by the Americans during Operation Paperclip, a secret US mission to capture German engineering information before the Soviets found it, and shipped this to the USA for evaluation. I really can't wait to see this properly restored, and the Smithsonian have done a brilliant job of giving respect to both German and Japanese engineers. This is the British Hawker Hurricane, which was designed in the late 1930s when monoplanes were considered to be too advanced and unstable to be successful. This was the first British monoplane fighter and the first to exceed 300 miles per hour at level flight, and played a major role in protecting the UK during the Battle of Britain. Next to it is a Lockheed P-38J Lightning, one of the most successful twin engine fighters ever made. These were fast due to two engines, and freeing out the nose allowed for more guns. Let's move back in time and have a look at the only remaining loaning OA-1A San Francisco, a two-seat amphibious biplane and operated by the US Navy and Army Air Corps. These first flew in 1923 and were made of duralumin, a copper aluminium alloy, and had a wooden frame. This did a Pan American goodwill flight in 1926 to 27, where they hoped to grow relations with Latin America and it also opened up the area to flight. Next is a Sopwith F 1 Camel, which is one of the most significant and famous World War I aircraft. These downed over 1,200 enemy aircraft, which was more than any other Allied fighter in World War I. They entered operational service in 1917 and over 5,000 were built. They were powered by different rotary engines and had two machine guns that would fire between the prop blades spinning past. This is a Van der Salle Bleriot 11, which was a French pre-war aircraft from 1909 and was a tractor configuration monoplane with a partially covered box girder fuselage made from ash with wire cross bracing. It used wing warping for lateral control. This is a French Caldron G4 twin-engine bomber and reconnaissance plane that first flew in 1915. Over 1400 were built and were powered by a Lerone 9-cylinder air-cooled rotary piston engines producing around 80 horsepower each. While it was eventually used as a bomber, its primary initial role was reconnaissance and then later on it was used as a trainer as it was relatively easy to fly. This is only one of two remaining examples anywhere in the world. It had a crew of two, with a pilot and the gunner, and could fly up to 13,000 feet with a top speed of around 77 miles per hour. It had a single machine gun and could carry 250 pounds of bombs. Moving back in time, and we have the Fowler Gage biplane from 1912. It was powered by a single Curtis 90 horsepower engine and used in many exhibition and passenger flights. In 1913, it flew ocean to ocean across Panama, which was especially difficult as there weren't any open areas along the route which could be used for emergency landings. Let's jump back into the future and have a look at the incredible Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird long-range high-altitude Mac 3 Plus reconnaissance aircraft, looking very sinister and sleek from this angle. It was introduced in 1966 and flew with the USAF until 1999. There was an interceptor YF-12 version, although it was never put into production, and I'll take you on a tour through that single prototype in another video. What's interesting with this is the bump here in the chines, and this is a part of the missile warning and electronic countermeasure system. When an enemy missile is detected by the antenna, radio waves are aimed at it to deflect the missile's onboard homing system away. There is only this system at the front and none further back because this flies so fast that no missile from behind is ever going to catch it. Under these chines was all of the photo reconnaissance equipment and in fact here's footage from the Evergreen Museum in Portland and you can see the actual extremely wide film that they would capture.
Moving back, and we have the Pratt & Whitney J58 turbojets, which had the unique feature where at high speeds, incoming air could bypass the compressors because the speed itself would act as the compressor, thus making it function like a ramjet. These are much more efficient than standard turbojets and allowed it to cruise at such high speeds. You can see the rear tyres are silver, and that's because they had aluminium inside the rubber, so that they could handle the extreme heat of the wheel well bay during supersonic cruises. The friction generated would heat the skin so much that standard rubber would simply melt. The forward landing gear has cooling air from the cockpit, hence why its tyres are just rubber. To help reduce the heat on certain parts of the aircraft, they would pump fuel around the plane to operate as a heat sink prior to being pumped to the engine for ignition. While this wasn't considered to be a stealthy plane, they did use radar absorbing materials on the skin to help reduce their chances of getting caught. And back to the Germans again, and we have this fascinating Messerschmitt ME 163 Comet, which was the first and only rocket powered interceptor and the first aircraft of any type to pass 1000 km an hour or 620 miles per hour in level flight. It would reach altitude quickly, but only had powered flight for 8 to 10 minutes, thus rendering it less effective than they hoped. 370 were built. Information was shared with their Japanese allies, and they produced the Mitsubishi J-8M, although only seven were built before the war ended. Here's the rocket motor, which would use hydrogen peroxide with hydrazine methanol mixture, which was extremely volatile and was the first variable thrust rocket engine, producing up to a maximum of 3,740 pounds of thrust. This museum is a five minute drive from Dulles International Airport and they have free luggage lockers for your baggage if you want to visit before your flight. I hope you enjoyed the video and if so, please comment below with what you found the most interesting. I personally enjoy the German aircraft in part because I did know much about them prior to visiting. It's really impressive how this American museum has also given respect to the engineers from the opposing sides during the wars. I have many other similar videos touring around American, British, Australian and German aviation museums on my channel, so please check them out. Thanks for watching.